All right. So now we're going to move to part two. Before we dive into part two, are there any questions about anything from part one? <coughs> I always want to give you an opportunity to talk about stuff in the text that I didn't just didn't go over because there's a lot of stuff in here. So is there anything in here you wanted to talk about that I didn't get into? Part one is mainly biographical in nature with some highlights. So there's not. It's fine if we move on. Um, part two. Um, is where he lays down his rules for his method. Before we get to the rules, he has some interesting things to say about the nature of acquiring knowledge. And this, and this in particular is really important for the meditations that we're about to get into. So he says on page 29, Because we were all children before being men, and because for a long time it was necessary for us to be governed by our appetites and our teachers, it is nearly impossible for our judgments to be as pure or as solid as they would have been, if we had the full use of reason from the moment of our birth, and if we had been guided by it alone. So this is a theme that we're going to pick up in in the next, uh, the next reading, in the meditations, but what he's getting at here is that it's kind of a shame, in a way, that when we're born, we don't have the full use of reason. Because what ends up happening is that over time, we pick up a bunch of false beliefs and things that are irrational just because, you know, we're kids and if somebody tells us to believe something, we believe it. And it's not until we become full adults that we're now being a lot more critical, or we should be a lot more critical about the beliefs that we entertain. Um, he uses this example on the bottom of the page um, about pulling down a house. Um, so let's take a look at this passage. This is the bottom right paragraph. It's, um, I'm going to read a good portion of it. Um, he says, It is true that we never see anyone pulling down all the houses in a city for the sole purpose of rebuilding them in a different style and of making the streets more attractive. But one does see very well that many people tear down their own houses in order to rebuild them, and that in some cases they are even forced to do so when their houses are in danger of collapsing and when the foundations are not very secure. This example persuaded me that it would not really be at all reasonable for a single individual to plan to reform a state by changing everything in it from the foundations up and by toppling it in order to set it up again nor even also to reform the body of the sciences or the order established in the schools for teaching them, but that, as regards all the opinions to which I had until now given credence, I could not do better than to try to get rid of them once and for all, in order to replace them later on, either with the ones that are better, or even with the same ones once I had reconciled them to the level of reason. And I firmly believe that by this means I would succeed in conducting my life much better than if I were to build only upon old foundations and if I were to rely only on the principles of which I had allowed myself to be persuaded in my youth without ever having examined them. So, um, what, do you, what do you take him to be saying in that example about this house? What is this business about pulling down houses is supposed to illustrate. Yeah. In what way? You can't build knowledge on top of a poor foundation. What happens if you do that? It's good. And so think about, that's right, so think about this quote now. Because we were children before we were men, we had to be governed by our appetites and our teachers. Other things told us what was valuable, what was important, what was true, what was false. Well, now that I'm a man, it's like look you need to look over your house and find out what's it built on. Is all the stuff that you picked up as a child right or wrong? Was it correct or incorrect? Did you get good education or a bad one? I see kind of each of the things that he takes his knowledge as being a separate house, and he's saying that you can you 
you take down some of them to rebuild them, but you don't take all of them down to rebuild them, to rebuild them all. So possibly that might be one thing he's getting at is that. I think it's a slightly different point. I don't know. What are some other thoughts about what he's saying about multiple houses? Why does he say we don't like destroy the whole village, but we, you know, individuals go one house at a time? Yeah. It's not common for people to question the knowledge um, that they've been given from birth, so maybe that's why you don't see a lot of people doing it. You only see select people questioning those types of things. So you take each house to be like an individual's. So it's just the village is not representative of your mind. One house is representative of your mind. Another house is another person. So he's he's saying maybe everybody doesn't have to go through with this, or I'm not telling everybody to do it. I'm just telling you what I did with my own house. In my own life, I wanted to make sure my house was on good foundation. And, it's, and maybe he's even saying it's not my job to go around telling other people what to do with their own homes. So by analogy, it's not my job to go around telling other people what to believe. I'm just telling you if you're interested in having a well-founded house, here's how you do it. This, here's how you check the foundations. In the same way, what we're going to be doing in here, if you want to find out if your beliefs are founded correctly on the right principles of knowledge, then I'm going to show you how to do that, but I'm not going to force you. Other thoughts on what this is about? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, because uh, he, he makes like an analogy to like how roads are made in cities and stuff out and how they're all yeah, yeah. like intertwined. But has like was he aware of like like um, <coughs> I don't know if this was at his time maybe because I know later on in history it's happened before like especially the dictators that like take down a city completely and like fix up the roads so their armies can pass through them. <laughs> so I'm just wondering like that ha is he was he not aware of that could happen or I don't know. I think one of the things he's also trying to say trying to find the passage if it was in this section um, where he wants to say that there's something about one mind also sort of doing all the planning of the city one co it coming from one person as opposed to a bunch of people together simultaneously planning all the different parts of the city that you get and that's one of the, I don't know if we're thinking the same passage but that's what I take from it is more of him saying one architect of a city makes for a better city than if you had a number of architects all designing different parts of the city at the same time. You get things that don't fit together. Other thoughts on, on these passages, these things? So we move on to the four rules. And this is a mix, some of his language, some of my language. Um, and he gives you the four rules on page 31. Um, these aren't bad rules to follow by. You know, if you want to print these out and put them on your mirror, you know, I wouldn't make I wouldn't make fun of you. Um, rule number one: Never accept anything as true that I did not plainly know n that I did not plainly know to be such. In other words, avoid hasty judgments. Don't just accept things. Rule number two: Divide problems into as many parts as possible. Sometimes we're given complex problems. The best way to approach these problems is to first break them down into parts. <coughs> Rule number three, think orderly. Start with the simplest and easiest to know and ascend slowly and carefully to more complex things. Um, so um, break things down into parts. When you start to, once you have broken them down into parts, start with the simplest parts, the things that are the easiest to know, and work your way up from there. And then finally, make enumerations, like take notes, so complete and reviews so general that I was assured to have omitted nothing. So as you work your way through these things, take good notes so that you know how you solved the problems. And it's going to be hard to hold all this into your, in your mind all at once. This, we're going to see him follow this, these rules, um, when we look at meditations. So this is, if you like these four rules, which they're not bad rules, um, you can see him, you, you, know, you want to see how does this play out. It gets played out in our very next reading.
So let's move to the controversial part five. How animals and humans differ. Um, when he takes us into part five, he, he lays out what he thinks are these sort of two conditions um, for determining if something has reason. So this is where part one kind of connects us back up with part five. Remember part one, that opening paragraph that reason is the most well-distributed thing, that all people have it. So he wants to now say that there are signs, there are ways that you can tell when something does not have reason. And he's going to, of course, apply this to animals. So he says one, one sign is that uh, the thing cannot use words or other signs to declare thoughts to others. And then secondly, it, even if it can perform one task better than humans, it will fail in trying to do other tasks. So, you know, horses are stronger than human beings, but they're not as smart as human beings. Um, dolphins can swim better than humans, but they're not so good at, um, you know, playing baseball. Let's take a look now at the argument he's going to give us against animals having minds. So after he um, gives these two reasons, let's start at the very bottom on 33, um, that little paragraph on the left side, and we're gonna, I'll read through this a, a good way. Now by these two means, one can also know the difference between men and beasts. For it is rather remarkable that there are no men so dull and so stupid, excluding not even the insane, that they are incapable of arranging various words together and of composing from them a discourse by means of which they might make their thoughts understood. And that, on the other hand, there is no other animal at all, however perfect and pedigreed it may be, that does the like. This does not happen because they lack the organs, for one sees that magpies and parrots can utter words just as we can, and yet they cannot speak as we do, that is, by testifying to the fact that they are thinking about what they are saying. On the other hand, men born deaf and dumb who are deprived just as much as, or more than beasts, uh, of the organs that aid others in speaking are wont to invent for themselves various signs by means of which they make themselves understood to those who, being with them on a regular basis, have the time to learn their language. And this attests not merely to the fact that the beasts have less reason than men, but that they have none at all. For it is obvious it does not need much to know how to speak. And since we notice as much inequality among animals of the same species as among men, and that some are easier to train than others, it is unbelievable that a monkey or a parrot that is the most perfect of its species would not equal in this respect one of the most stupid children, or at least a child with a disordered brain, if their souls were not of a nature entirely different from our own. <coughs> and then skip to the very bottom, going up four lines. So this is in, in terms of the second condition. He says the fact that they can't do the things humans can do so well. This proves that they have no intelligence at all and that it is nature that acts in them according to the disposition of their organs. Just as we see that a clock composed exclusively of wheels and springs can count the hours and measure time more accurately than we can with all our carefulness. Okay. Let me tell you something about Descartes. Descartes was really interested, as you heard from the biography at the start of class, in science. He was interested in biology. How do you learn about biology? Well, one major way is through dissecting things, right? You take biology class, you have a lab, and you get these like formaldehyde filled, you know, like frogs and things that you cut open, and that helps you understand stuff, I'm sure. Descartes liked dissecting things, but not, they didn't have these laboratories you sent off and you got formaldehyde filled frogs. What did you do? You picked up a stray cat off the street. 
And what Descartes was known for taking one off, you know, taking a stray cat or a stray dog off the street, hammering nails into its paws, and then while it was alive, cutting it open <coughs> and doing a live dissection of the animal. He believed what he just wrote here, that animals, he says souls here. Animals don't have souls, animals don't have minds. They don't think, they don't feel. They have no, they have no consciousness, is what he's saying. And if they don't have consciousness, then there's nothing wrong with taking an animal up off the street, hammering nails into its paws so it can be put up on your bulletin board, and cutting it open to look at how it works on the inside. What do y'all think about Descartes' argument here? Do you think that it, he's justified in doing that to animals? Yeah? If he's nailing it somewhere and it's like, obviously it's going to make noises and pain, do you want to think that's a signal saying that it's conscious to know what's going on, like knows what's going on? So this is what he wants to say about that. That that is just a mechanical response. It's not because it is undergoing any kind of consciousness. The dog or the cat that screams out feels no more than the your car feels something when you hit the horn. Like if you hit the horn of your car, you don't go, whoop, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. You just go, it's just a mechanical response. So like they didn't have cars then, so what did he compare that to? You know what I mean? A clock. So like when your clock um, you know, if it's got a little chime on it, you don't think it's trying to tell you something when it chimes, or that it intends to communicate. It's just a mechanical response. Well, it's the clock is a man-made item, where the dog is not. It's like something that there. We'll see this play out a little more in Descartes' philosophy, but this is the difference, is that he's going to say that those are all material things. So matter, he's going to argue, doesn't have consciousness in it. The only thing that could have consciousness is a mind. So we have signs that animals have, are made out of matter, that animals are material things, but we don't have any evidence that they are thinking things, is what he will say. So what happens when he cuts it open and sees that it has a brain? Then what does he think that doesn't think? The brain is not the same thing as thought. So a brain, I mean, you can study, let's say that you're imagining a pink elephant right now, because that's a live one, not a, one that's being tortured by Descartes. <laughs> because that's much happier than the other thoughts, right? If you're thinking about a pink elephant right now, I could look <laughs> inside your brain, but I'll never see a pink elephant there. I'm going to see gray matter, I'm going to see chemical reactions, I'm going to see, you know, you know, electrical chemical processes at best. But I don't see the pink elephant. Where is the pink elephant? The pink elephant is in your mind. So Descartes going to say, I know they've got brains, and that's part of the elaborate machines that they are. But that doesn't mean that they have thoughts or consciousness. I was just going to say, because I, I, I remember seeing a video where they actually uh, hooked up electrodes to someone's brain. They actually were able to mm -hmm. make a rough image of what they were thinking when they saw an image. Mm -hmm. And it matched up, up interestingly well. Uh, but so I, I would argue that maybe there is something there. Not just like, like a real pink elephant, of course, but like a thought. So. We're going to talk a lot more about this when we get to the very end of the meditations. This is one of his key arguments in the piece, um, where he's going to try to argue that mind, and this is a theme through the whole era, this whole era, we're going to talk a lot about the consciousness and minds, which I think is really cool. But he's going to argue that mind and matter are utterly, completely separate things. They have nothing in common. We'll see how that plays out. Did he ever, like, observe these said animals in their own natural... Habitat. I think so, yeah. So, if you were to observe a gorilla where a gorilla comes across, or a chimpanzee comes across an anthill where he wants to eat ants, and he can't get the ants, so he takes a tree branch and sticks it down into the anthill and pulls out ants to eat, what would he say of that? It's a mechanical response, like, have you ever seen those little floor vacuums that are automatic, like you don't have to like push them, but that, you know, they just are self-guided? Well, you might say that's kind of what's going on there. It's a mechanism by which this machine knows how to, when it's running low on, you know, food or nutrients, it is a, a, a mechanical response to get what it needs. You, you, you don't think you would look at that as like a 
thought process is using a tool, like a human would use a tool. Descartes wouldn't. Don't don't and don't confuse me for Descartes. I'm just saying. I'm just I'm just the messenger. I'm just saying. That's what Descartes would say. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like if, oh, You're fine. Oh, okay. So if Descartes like saw a person who was brain dead, so he'd like those two like rules or whatever up there, they wouldn't fall under that. So does that mean that they would have no reason? They are still a person, but they can't think. They can't make signals or talk. That's they can't do anything better than an animal. So. If a person was permanently in that kind of state, maybe he would say that you know, they, they no longer have reason. Oh, okay. it, it, that's a good point. I mean, that, and that's, that's actually a really good way to, like, that's, a, that's the way philosophers think, is we say, okay, let's run this to its logical conclusion and see if we can live with that. Yeah? Well, I was just going to point out that um, we didn't actually know about chimpanzees or gorillas up until just a few hundred years ago. So we had no idea of these these apes that have intelligent, that have populated intelligence. It was just, he, he saw monkeys as he said in the art as in the thing. He didn't actually see larger apes. Yeah, and a lot of our science on this stuff has advanced greatly in the past <laughs> even hundred years. Um, so he observed some of these things, but certainly not to the same degree we have. I still think he wouldn't have bought it, uh, at least he would have to give up certain other things in his philosophy. I don't think he's willing to give up yet. Yeah, Zach? I think that even if he were to come across a brain-dead human, he would still not change his way of thinking uh, philosophically because it seems that he puts, even in the rule number two, um, if they perform a task better than humans, he puts humans on some kind of higher <coughs> ability, higher, like a pedestal almost. So even if the human was brain dead or um, unable to function, he would still have some kind of reason behind why humans can think. Even, I don't know how to describe it, but mm -hmm. I feel like he puts humans on a different level. And that's right. I mean, he certainly thinks there's something special about humans. You know, I don't, it's kind of an interesting question what Descartes would do if he was, you know, in charge of somebody's, you know, living will. Yeah. What about like newborn babies? Like, they don't have thoughts. They don't, like, they know, like, when they're hungry, they, like, cry, but they're not, like, thinking, I'm so hungry, and you should start crying. So, like, but then animals, they already have, like, they basically have their senses to know, like, what they need. I don't know exactly what Descartes says about newborns. Another really good question. I think he might at least say something like, "Well, they have the potential. We know what happens over time." Yeah. So it's not like we, it's not like half if half of the newborns eventually developed language and the other half didn't. That might be an issue. But since all newborn humans do eventually acquire language, maybe he might say that they've got that capacity. Yeah. Uh, I think that. You just think they all act off of instinct instead of because they don't they don't they don't know that animals do all the stuff that we know they do. So he thinks differently, and it's just instinct everything that they they do. Like he gets he cuts it open, and it just it's free, it's freaking out to begin with. Yeah, and that's just what it, it's like a response to being in danger. I guess. Yeah, and that's the thing to think. I mean, it's just reflex responses as well he, that he thinks this is. Um, in fact, Descartes, he would complain when the ant cat was like screaming. He just cut its vocal cords. He'd be like, "Well, okay, I'll, you know, it's like the horn's going off in the car, and it's bothering me. I'll just cut the wire." Um, you know. Well, I guess it's like hard for us to look at it now because I mean, then they you know like things are made up of cells. Like then nothing about that, and we know so much. We're so advanced that it's hard to kind of think back to the basic brain that actually humans had kind of back then. I also think it's kind of cool to compare, on this point, Descartes and Montaigne, because Montaigne actually seems to have a high view of animals. Like He's like, maybe animals know stuff we don't know. <laughs> Descartes is saying, you know, animals don't know anything. They, they have no thoughts, no consciousness. We alone are special like this. And this maybe now is where you might say, I like Montaigne again. Uh, Montaigne, I like the fact that he's kind of saying we should be more humble in our claims about knowledge and not too quick to dismiss other possibilities. If you, there is a paper in this class that you have to do where you write uh, in response to some contemporary piece on Descartes. If this is something that interests you. There's a lot of stuff written about this. If you want to find, if you need help finding it, uh, I'd be happy to take you there. Um, oh, 
we already did that. Okay. So discourse on method. Here are some of the main takeaways, right? Reason, he argues, is the essence of being human. We're going to see more about that. Secondly, that the difference between those who find truth and those who find falsehood concerns the use of reason, not the amount of reason. And this is where his four rules are very applicable, because he thinks these four rules will help us in the use of our reason, and they will guide us to the truth, as opposed to letting us fall astray. And finally, this last bit we just did about animals. He argues that animals are not rational creatures like us. Something that most of us are not inclined to accept. Um, let me switch over. We're going to start talking about the meditations. Were there any final questions, comments about uh, discourse on method? Once again, we flew through this piece much faster than I would have liked. Then, let's move to this one. So here are our, our famous philosophers. Um, we're going to move to Descartes' meditations. It is, it's, this piece of philosophy is arguably the most influential piece of philosophy ever in the history of humanity. So the fact that you are reading this and we are studying it is really very important. He he sets up the issues and the problems and some of the solutions that have been talked about ever since. Like, we are still, today, writing and discussing and figuring out the things that he set out. He gave us the agenda for philosophy in the West. The only philosophers I think that you can say rival his influence and importance are Plato and Aristotle. And this piece in particular is like his defining work. What we're going to see in this are some themes. The foundation for science, as he sees it. The ability to discern truth from falsehood. The existence of God, the existence of the soul, as well as some other things. But this is what this piece is about. He is trying to give us a road map to having knowledge. Let's begin with meditation number one. The opening paragraph is such a nice beginning paragraph. I hope, if you've had me for intro, you know I like to read it, and we're going to read it in here too. Um, so take a look, open it up to page 40, and let's just look at these, the opening part here. Several years have now passed since I first realized how numerous were the false opinions that in my youth I had taken to be true, and thus how doubtful were all those that I had subsequently built on them. And thus I realized that once in my life I had to raise everything to the ground and begin again from the original foundations if I wanted to establish anything firm and lasting in the sciences. All right. He's raising up the problem of false beliefs here. So, over the course of our lives, we have mixed in true beliefs with false beliefs. There are things that your friends, your parents, your teachers, the internet, TV, radio, whatever has influenced you to kind of take to be that this is true. These are parts of the ways you look at the world. So, over the, the problem is that over the course of our lives, We've taken these beliefs, and some of them are true, and some of them are false. However, the new beliefs that we acquire typically depend upon the prior ones. But this is only going to give me more knowledge if my prior beliefs are true. The solution that he puts forward here is in that quote where he says, Once in my life I had to raise everything to the ground and begin again from the original foundations. What does this word raise, spelled this way, R-A-Z-E, what does that mean, to raise something to the ground? 
I think of like a bulldozer. Kind of like Demolish. Mm -hmm. Utterly wipe it out. Annihilate it. So when they talk about raising a building with spelled this way, they're not talking about what we're doing at the library out there. We're talking about the opposite. To raise it to the ground means to just completely destroy it. So once in the time of my, the way that, so this is what he's getting at. I've got a little diagram here. Here's the, a very crude way to think about the way our beliefs work, according to Descartes. We've got basic beliefs that we start out with, and from those basic beliefs we infer other beliefs, and those beliefs we use to infer other beliefs. And this would, of course, this is actually an accurate diagram of our belief system. It would be huge, right? If you have, you know, a myriad of beliefs. But this is what happens: is that what if falsehood slips in down there? Well, that falsehood will get transferred to the other beliefs, or at least it could. If you start out with some falsehood and you base a belief on that then it's very likely the beliefs you base on it will turn out to be false as well. If they turn out to be true, it would just be by luck. Descartes is really concerned that over the course of our lives, we've let these falsehoods infect our belief systems. And here we are today, and we can't tell the true beliefs from the false ones. I mean, think about all the things you believe. You have beliefs about the nature of, you know, electrons. You got beliefs about who your parents are. You got beliefs about where you park your car today. You have beliefs about um, <clears throat> how much money is in your bank account. You have beliefs about um, how many planets there are in our solar system. Um, you probably have some beliefs about God. You probably got beliefs about your own, you know, whether you will have a life after death or not. Do you think every single belief that you hold is true? Or do you think that probably somewhere in there there's bound to be some wrong ones? I would venture to guess that if you really thought about that issue, all of us would say, I'm, I'm sure there's some things I believe that are incorrect. Here's the rub. Do you know which beliefs are incorrect? And it seems like the answer should be no, because if you knew which, one they, which ones they were, you wouldn't believe them anymore, would you? So Descartes' solution is to raise everything to the ground. So if this diagram is the structure, to raise it to the ground means to wipe everything out for a moment, to start over, to get rid of all of our beliefs, even the true ones, because we need to find a, a better way to make sure there are no false ones mixed in. Let's read a little bit more about the solution on page 41. And this is on the left column. Um, yet, to bring this about, I will not need to show that all my opinions are false, which is perhaps something I could never accomplish, but reason now persuades me that I should withhold my assent no less carefully from opinions that are not completely certain and indubitable than I would from those that are patently false. For this reason, it will suffice for the rejection of all these opinions by finding each of them some reason for doubt. Nor, therefore, need I survey each opinion individually, a task that would be endless, rather because undermining the foundations will cause whatever has been built upon them to crumble of its own accord, I will attack straight away those principles which I, which I which supported everything I once believed. This is called the method of doubt. And, he, and you could use it by a kind of test of dubitability. Dubitable is just a nice word for doubtfulness. And indubitable means incapable of being doubted. And what he's putting forward in this is that if a belief can be doubted, then let's reject it. At least for the moment. This is what we're going to follow. A belief can be doubted, reject it. If a belief is indubitable, or you could say absolutely certain, not capable of any doubt, then we will accept it. That is the method that he wants to follow here. Um, so, the other thing to notice with what he's doing is that he doesn't want us to go through and doubt 
each and every individual belief that we hold. That would take too long. You believe that 1 plus 1 is 2. You believe 2 plus 1 is 3. You believe 3 plus 1 is 4. How many of those beliefs you got? An infinite number. You, it, we, we would never get to the bottom of those. Um, you know, you believe that there are, you know, at least three people in the room. You believe there are at least four people in the room. You believe there are less than a hundred people in the room. I mean, think about all the beliefs that you possess. And these are all, and the things I'm listing seem kind of trivial. We haven't even got to the serious ones. So rather than going and trying to doubt each and every item of belief that you hold, what you should do is see if we can get to the source of those beliefs. So if we can undermine the source of the belief, then we will be able to doubt all the beliefs based on that source. Questions about the dubitability test or the method of doubt here? Yeah? Is that like saying you believe like 3 plus 1 is 4, things like that? You should go and doubt mathematics? Yeah, so we're going to see how that's possible in a moment. But for the, for the time being, if you want to, so if you say, well, how, how are we going to test 3 plus 1 is 4? We're going to try to find a way if there's anything that we can say about the most general concepts in our mind. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Any other thoughts on, on this? Everybody see at least the setup here. The nice, the, the, and this is the way this is supposed to work. If we can, do I have that? Um, Oh, sorry, and this is the quote that explains that. I read that already. Okay, we don't have to, to show all the opinions are false. We just have to show the source they come from is false. So attack those principles which supported everything I once believed. So once again, we come back to this diagram. This is what he wants to do. He wants to find starting points that will give us certainty. If we can get certainty into these most fundamental, most basic beliefs that we hold, and then carefully think about how we infer other beliefs from them, then we will get certainty all the way to the top. And if we can get certainty in all levels, aha, no false beliefs. And this is something that he says we need to have a sure and lasting foundation for science. In contrast to the Aristotelian philosophy that was out there, he thinks this is a far better way to go about getting that philosophical basis or foundation for science. Let's see how this plays out. Um, so the, if you had to find one kind of source that tells you for sure that you know things are, are real, most of us would run to the senses. This is what Montaigne talked about, that the senses are the source of all knowledge. That it, I mean, seeing it, tasting it, feeling it, touching it, all of that is proof of reality. So Descartes runs to this first. Are the senses an indubitable source for forming beliefs? And he says, I have noticed that the senses are sometimes deceptive, and it is a mark of prudence never to place our complete trust in those who have deceived us even once. This is where Descartes' skepticism is a little bit like Montaigne's skepticism. That Descartes' skepticism um, is pointing out that there are those illusions and there are those mistakes. There are those little things like the Miller Lyre illusion or the, that slide I had with all the different colored wheels that look like they're spinning that your senses do deceive you. Um, that doesn't always carry the day for people because they say that's only about slight things. What about, like, there are certain things when I'm up close and when I'm really careful, my senses don't deceive me. So let's take a look at his famous dream argument, the paragraph on the top right of 41. He says, This would all be well and good were I not a man who is accustomed to sleeping at night into experiencing in my dreams the very same things or, um, or now and then even less plausible ones as these insane people do when they are awake. How often does my evening slumber persuade me of such ordinary things as these, that I am here, clothed in my dressing gown, seated next to the fireplace, when in fact 
I am lying undressed in bed. It's a little too much information. Uh, but right now, my eyes are certainly wide awake when I gaze upon this sheet of paper. This head, which I am shaking, is not heavy with sleep. I extend this hand consciously and deliberately, and I feel it. Such things would not be so distinct for someone who is asleep. As, as if I did not recall having been deceived on other occasions, even by similar thoughts in my dreams. <clears throat> in other words, as I consider these matters more carefully, I see so plainly that there are no definite signs by which to distinguish being awake from being asleep. So, this is the key thing that we just read. He says there are no definite signs by which to distinguish being awake from being asleep or from dreaming. This kind of leads to an interesting question. How do you know you're not dreaming? Anybody know what this is from? Yeah, this is from Inception. And uh, in that movie, uh, you know, it's all about people who are in dreams and tricking one another. And one of the things in the whole movie is whether the whole movie takes place in a dream. And the answer is it does. Um, I can tell you why after class. But let me ask a more general question, Don't, not necessarily about the movie, but which is, I mean, have you, can you tell being awake from dreaming? Is it possible to be sure? Have you ever had a dream that was so real that you acted on it? Like a dream where you talked to a friend on the phone and made plans, and then when you woke up, you went through your day and presumed you had talked to that person on the phone? When I was in middle school, I had a dream that I'd ask a girl out, and she'd said yes. <laughs> And then I did some embarrassing things the next day at school. <laughs> it's, n I would say, because dreams are like reality. They are so much like reality, you can't tell them apart. Do you agree with that? Yeah? I think sometimes you think they're real, but I mean, there's a certain... You know, you're going to wake up and be like, oh... Was that real? And he's like, oh, wait, I'm in bed. <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes it plays out that way, although I want to always say, but does it always play out that way? No. I mean, it's maybe you might wake up, like, during it, and that's when you realize it's not real, but if it, if it ends and then you wake up however long later, you might think it's, it wasn't it happened at the time. Mm -hmm. And, like, there's, like, the lucid dreaming, mm -hmm. where, like, you're sleeping, but you're consciously aware that you're dreaming, and then... So <laughs> sometimes we can kind of take control, or we can do that, of course. But can we always do that? No. And that's all Descartes needs for his argument. All he needs is the possibility that even right now, for all you know, you could be dreaming. Maybe you fell asleep this afternoon and you're taking a nap. And you're so concerned about this class, anxious about it because we haven't met, that you're now dreaming about it. How do you know that you're not dreaming right now? How do you know you're not going to wake up and have to go to class? Have you ever had a dream like that, where it's like you had a dream like you were getting ready in the morning, and then you wake up, and then you have to get ready in the morning? <laughs> How do you know? Yeah? Can you go by certain senses? Like, for example, like... I was involved in a car fire several years ago, and for months after, I had the same recurring dream where I was in a car, I was in a fire. Mm. And after so long, I would realize I'm in flames, and I <coughs> do not feel pain. I'm terrified of what I'm seeing, like the, se like the mm -hmm. sense of sight, yes. But as far as touching, I wasn't, I couldn't feel burning, and that's when I would wake myself mm. up from the dream. And I had it over and over repeatedly, and that's how I would wake myself up. I realized I'm not, I don't feel pain from this. This is kind of an interesting question. Sometimes people say in dreams you can't feel pain. Has anyone felt pain in a dream? I have. So, but uh, yeah. What do you mind sharing, or do you, can you recall? Um, I had a dream that I got hit by a car, I think. And when I woke up, like it, it felt like it, it was extremely painful. And when I woke up, I was sore the next day, and 
I mean, obviously, if I got hit by a car, it'd be more than sore, <laughs> but I still did feel a lot of pain, and when I woke up, I was in pain. Mm. Yeah. You could feel, I think, like, mental type of pain. I know that sometimes, like, depending on what type of dream you have, you can wake up and you feel, like, just, like, overwhelming anxiety or fear. Mm-hmm. Um, you crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you could feel, like, kind of like the rush from the dream. Like, I've had this, dr I've had a certain dream, like, four or five times already, like, throughout my whole life, where I feel like I'm, like, falling. <laughs> like, I, like, jumped off a cliff or something, I've fallen into, like, trees, <laughs> and I wake up, like, oh, my God. And, like, if I feel that same way every time that's when I wake up. Like, so... I don't know if there's anything that you experience that could possibly be a telltale sign that says always when you when it's like this you're dreaming. After all, what's going on when you dream is just the same. I mean, the exact same parts of your brain are activated that are taking place when you're having sensory experience. It's just replicating that experience. So if you're dreaming, there would be nothing in there that that would necessarily tell you you're dreaming. A lot of times we find things that tell we're dreaming, but it's just by accident. Like, reality doesn't make sense or things like that. But if you had a consistent dream, there'd be no reason why, how you could tell. And that's Descartes' argument. Um, you can try to write all this down, or you can look this up on the, the video later. But here is one way to think about the dream argument. For any particular claim, about a physical object we can just call X. So X is a placeholder for like the cup on the table, the book in front of you. Um, if one knows that X is true, or maybe we should say that X, you know, some claim about X is true, then one can distinguish the truth of X from its falsely appearing to be true in a dream. This is a claim that's about the standard you have to meet in order to have knowledge. If you really know something is true, then you should be able to tell its truth from a falsehood. Think of like counterfeit money. If you are, an, if like you're hired by like a bank, I know they have like machines and stuff that do this. Suppose there aren't such machines. They hire experts. You are supposed to be an expert to distinguish real money from counterfeit money. You can only really claim to know what real money is if, when presented the counterfeits, you can tell them apart. If, uh, you know, they lent me the Mona Lisa for this class, and they let me bring in the Mona Lisa and a replication of the Mona Lisa done by um, an art student. If it was done really well, I couldn't tell them apart, because I don't really know much about art and brush strokes and all those kinds of things. If you can't tell the real thing apart from a false impression, then you don't know what the real thing is. In the same way, Descartes is saying if you can't tell the difference between something truly being the case and it's falsely appearing to be true in a dream, then you are not entitled to say that you know what it is. And then the second claim is for any particular claim about physical object X, one cannot distinguish the truth of X from its falsely appearing to be true in a dream. So this is just saying that we don't meet the standard. So the first one is saying, here's what the standard is for knowing. The second claim is saying, we fail to meet the standard. We can't tell the difference between these experiences of being awake from experiences of dreaming. And therefore, it logically follows from these two claims that for any particular claim about physical object X, one cannot know that X is true. There's the argument. <coughs> Another thing, by the way, if you want to write a paper, there's a lot of literature and philosophy about this argument that is very interesting. So here's the rub on the dream argument. Sense experience cannot be an indubitable source for <coughs> one's belief system. All the stuff you acquire through the five senses is subject to doubt because anything you get through the five senses could be misleading because it could be the result of a dream. And if you think about it, how do you know you're not going to wake up tomorrow and be like a five-year-old kid who just had a very long dream? 
be kind of cool because now all the stuff you know. But um, all the stuff you get through your 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 senses are subject to doubt. Now, this is an important thing. It only casts doubt on our knowledge of particular things. That is, partic particular things as in this book or that cup or this person's clothing or the, you know, the crucifix on that wall, like particulars. But one of the things he brings up, I'm not going to read the passage, you can look at it if you like, on 41 and 42, is that dreams are composed of things derived from general concepts. Um, and those general concepts may imply some truth about reality. So you might think about the, f the contents of your dream. Where do you get these ideas? Um, if we're dreaming about having a book in front of us, where did you get the concept of a book? If you're dreaming about of being in a classroom, where did you get the concept of a class? These are all things, these general concepts are not called into doubt <coughs> by his dream argument. <coughs> so <coughs> this only would draw, bring us into doubt about claims about the existence of particular things and where they are and how they are. It does not give us any doubt for general, universal concepts and truths. So, the next challenge for Descartes, then, is to come up, is there any basis for doubt about those kinds of things? Before I turn to that, let me entertain, if there are any questions, comments, witty rejoinders, anything about this aspect of, of the dream argument. So <clears throat> let's consider now what he call what we call the God argument. God, as you all may know, is supposed to be an, uh, an omnipotent being. Omnipotence means the ability to do anything. God, there's nothing that is too difficult for God to do. Now, could God have made us? So that we systematic, so that we are systematically in error when we make judgments about general universal concepts. Doesn't this prove the possibility for error about our judgments about uni general universal concepts? So, for instance, you might think here's a general universal concept, uh, or a belief you would get from that: all squares have four sides. It's not a belief about a particular square; it's a belief about all squares, a general idea of a square. How do you know that God has not arranged your mind such that you arrive at that belief falsely? That you think it applies to all squares, but somehow there's actually some squares it doesn't apply to. <coughs> or that, um, here's a general belief, um, red, is a co red is a color. <coughs> it's not about any particular red or some particular instance of red. It, it's about, in general, red is a color. You might think that's got to be true. But Descartes is going to say, how do you know God didn't arrange your mind such that you think that red is a color, but it actually is something else, or that that's not generally and universally true about red? After all, if God is truly omnipotent, as we all think he is, then if there is a God, he could have made it such that um, we think red is a color when it really isn't. Now, he does raise one important problem here. God is supposed to be a perfect being as well. He's not just an omnipotent being. And so, it wouldn't be appropriate to think that God could deceive us in this way. So, the God argument kind of falls apart on this end, which is that since God is supposed to be a morally perfect being, in addition to being an all-powerful one, um, even though God has the ability to deceive us, it doesn't follow that God, in fact, uh, could follow through with that and do it. At least for the moment, he's going to set this aside and say, maybe I shouldn't push this argument. He brings up a materialistic or evolutionary argument. So, you, one other thing you might bring up with this is you might say, well, I don't believe in God. I think that we are just, all that exists is matter and the laws of physics and that we come from just that process. There's no God, there's no design, we're just here. Um, 
here's how he so he says let's consider that possibility um, so look at the paragraph I'm going to start at the very bottom left on 42 um, he says perhaps there are some who would rather deny so powerful a God than believe that everything else is uncertain <coughs> let us not oppose them rather let us grant that everything said here about God is fictitious now they suppose that I came to be what I am either by fate or by chance or by connected by a connected chain of events or by some other way. So in other words, like imagine contemporary evolution, like a materialistic godless form of evolution. But because being deceived and being mistaken appear to be certain imperfections, the less powerful they take the author of my origin to be, the more probable it will be that I am so imperfect that I am always deceived. The argument he's kind of putting forward here is something like this. If I've been produced by imperfect forces, that would make me even more subject to being an imperfect thing. So, I mean, imagine this. If you... This is sort of an old lesson in computer programming. Um, computers used to be programmed by punch cards. Um, and so you'd have these like big cards, and then they'd have little punched out holes, and you'd use the, do, put them in the computer in certain order, in certain ways, and that's how you would actually institute a computer program. Both of my parents are computer programmers from way back in the day, and at least my dad has experience even doing this. Suppose that we wanted to create a computer program to land an airplane. And here's how we're going to program it. I'm going to take a bunch of punch cards, throw them out on a football field, and ask a bunch of football players to run over them in their cleats to create the, the holes. And then we'll collect all the cards, and then we'll put them in the machine. How optimistic are you that the machine is going to be successful at instituting a program to land an airplane? I hope that it's very pessimistic that you're not going to get in that airplane. Now, Descartes is kind of saying the same kind of thing about us. If we are the product of some random, unplanned, uh, undesigned, imperfect process, why should you trust the very mind that you're using? Your mind is not equipped, or you have no good reason to think that your mind should help you with abstract universal truths. So, here's the way that it plays out when we want to do the whole argument. It is possible that human cognitive faculties originate solely from the, res originate solely from the result of fate, chance, or other imperfect causes. Anything produced by fate, chance, or other imperfect causes is subject to error. Therefore, it is possible that anything produced by human cognitive faculties is subject to error. There's actually a lot of fascinating literature on this kind of argument. There's a recent uh, op-ed in the New York Times by uh, a philosopher who's a Christian and believes in God, and he puts forward his own version of something like this at the end of the interview. Um, I don't know... If Probably I'm the only one in the room who's seen this interview, but it's a really interesting interview. Um, so he's trying to introduce the idea that even if you don't even need God to get this kind of doubt, just the fact that you might think that you're constituted out of this kind of process should bring to your mind the very possibility that, for all you know, your mind has been put been put together by unreliable non-truth-seeking processes. The very last version that he goes through is what is called the evil genius. Sometimes it's called the evil demon argument. In our translation, they use genius. Um, and this spans 42, 43, the very, that very last paragraph where he suggests, all right, I'll suppose not that God is deceiving me because God cannot be a deceiver. He's a perfect being but rather that a supremely powerful and clever being who has directed his entire effort at deceiving me is doing this. 
And so the rhetorical question is, how do you know an evil genius is not systematically deceiving you to believe only what is false? So think about the possibility that somebody could have kidnapped you, taken you to some neuroscientific lab, and is playing games with your brain. How do you know that that didn't happen to you? And part of the things that they're able to manipulate and do with this machine is cause you to forget that you were kidnapped, and secondly, cause you to believe all sorts of crazy and false things. Um, you, as far as you know, um, that's a possibility. So here is where we end. You're like, that's it? We're not going to answer that? At the end of the first meditation, this is where we're supposed to be. <coughs> we have... So the problem that we're trying to address is the very fact that we have false beliefs that have been mixed in with our true beliefs, and we can't tell one apart from the other. The solution is for us to reject anything that is subject to doubt and to only believe those things that are certain. Given the dream argument, the evolutionary materialism argument, and the evil genius argument, we're now in a place where we have doubted knowledge of particulars, and we're also doubting our knowledge of general concepts, truths that come from those general ideas and universal concepts that we have. So where we should be right now in our belief system is a blank slate. We should be in a place where we're able to just start over to, as he said at the beginning of the essay, to raise it to the ground. And while this is a little unfortunate because now we don't believe anything, there's a, there's a good side to this. The good side is we've now started over. That's what we want to do. We found a way to start fresh. Now all we need is to find something that is not subject to doubt. We need to find a certainty. That takes us to meditation too. Here, by the way, is a nice picture of the young Descartes. Always, most of the pictures have happen with that little French mustache thing. I don't know, I kind of like this look for him. All right. What we're going to do in Meditation 2 is we are going to look for that proper source of knowledge that gives us certainty. And he gives it to us on page 43. Um, so let's... Let's take a look at this paragraph in the middle of 43. It says, But how do I know there is not something else over and, and above all those things that I have just reviewed, concerning which there is not even the slightest occasion for doubt? Is there not some God, or by whatever name I might call him, who instills these very thoughts in me? But why would I think that, since I myself perhaps could be the author of these thoughts? Well then, am I not at least something? But I've already denied that I have any senses and any body. Still, I hesitate. For what follows from this? Am I so tied to a body that the senses, and, and to the senses, that I cannot exist without them? Well, but I've persuaded myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world. No earth, no sky, no minds, no bodies. Is it then the case that I too do not exist? But doubtless I did exist if I persuaded myself of something. But what if there is some deceiver or other who is supremely powerful and is supremely sly, who is always deliberately deceiving me? Well then, there too is no doubt that I exist if he is deceiving me. And let him do his best at deception. He will never bring it about that I am nothing, as long as I think that I am something. <clears throat> Thus, after everything that has been most carefully weighed, it must finally be established that this pronouncement, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time I utter it or conceive it in my mind. Here is our certainty. Here is an example of the kind of thing that has to be true. Sometimes this is referred to as the cogito, uh, which is actually the, the, ver the fuller version of I think, therefore I am. Um, he doesn't say I think, therefore I am in the meditations. He actually says I think, therefore I am in the complete version of the discourse on method which was not included in ours. What he's saying here is that this kind of belief is one that is necessarily true every time I utter it or conceive it in my mind. The key here is not that there's something special about 
the belief that I exist in and of itself, like the content of the belief. It's that there's something about the way in which we form it, or the way in which we know it to be true. This is the kind of belief that is impervious to the most skeptical doubts, um, and it's the one that you understand must be true whenever you think it. That's what he's looking for. This is our new found beginning, is this type of belief. So if we can just find lots of beliefs that are like this, that whenever you think them or conceive them, they must be true. That even if you're being deceived by an evil demon, they have to be true. That's what he thinks we need to find. More of these kinds of beliefs. Yeah? Uh, how can you say that if he thinks that you never know when you're dreaming? So, suppose we are dreaming right now. Would it follow you don't exist? Could be like the he's saying that like if someone's dreaming of him that he doesn't exist and they do. So that's So do it from your perspective and think about so when you say when he says that I am I exist, he's not saying Descartes exists. He wants you to be doing this for yourself. You say to yourself, I am, I exist. Could you have that thought and be wrong? How could you have the belief and be wrong? Well, I mean, I, I think everyone everyone thinks they exist, but then he says that no one knows if they're dreaming or not. So just don't worry about other people. Just think for your think about your own individual existence. Because even if you're being deceived, like something is being deceived, then even if you're dreaming, someone is having the dream. So even, what he wants to say is that even under the most skeptical circumstances, you might be able to doubt if there are other people, and, he's, and so I'm not saying you should believe other people exist. You might be able to doubt if you look the way you look. He's even going to say you might be able to doubt if you even have a body at all. Maybe we don't even have bodies. Um, you might be able to doubt if, you know, all these sort of de biographical details of your life, but here's one thing you couldn't doubt, that there is something that is you. Because if you didn't exist, then you it's couldn't not, be having these thoughts. It's not like a physical existence, it's just your... Thought. Yeah. Your consciousness. Yeah. That's what he's getting at. Is that there's some center of consciousness that is having these thoughts, these doubts, these dreams. And that's undeniable. That there's some consciousness that has these things. It's a good question. Um... So he wants to make it clear about the nature of this thing that he calls I. Because it's real easy to mistakenly think that once you say I am, I exist, you can know that you are like the way you are, that you have your past history. I'm not going to read page 44 because I'm trying to get through some material here. But let's see what things that he wants to say here. Um, so one thing I want to point out with this is that the I that he is talking about here is not the I that has a body. It is not a, it's not the same thing as um, having you know, body parts and, and looking a certain way. Um, he's thinking about a center of consciousness. Something that is holding thoughts. Um, and he says this, which is a really nice summary of what he wants to say, we can say about the I. What is the I? It's a thing that thinks. And what is that? It's a thing that has doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wills, refuses, and also imagines and senses. Whatever this I is, it's whatever it is that has all of those functions or has all those kinds of mental activities. That's what he's going to be getting at. When you... When you think about the I, when you think about I am, what am I? Don't picture your body. Don't picture the way you look. Don't associate all the external things associated with you. Think about your thoughts. And this is really important because Descartes thinks that we make a grave mistake in that we think that picturing something, like having a visual image of it, is the same thing as the real thing. 
In fact, he's going. What he's really trying to get you to realize is that there's a way about thinking about things that's not pictorial, that's not visual, that's not sensory, and that that's actually the more clear way to understand what something really and truly is. And that's what we should do with the self. That when you think about yourself, don't think of your body. Just think about this thinking thing that is not in any way sensory, that's not a sensory thing at all. You just, but you know what it is. So, the I is not the same thing as the body, because it's possible to be, to be deceived that you have a body while thinking that I am exist. Whatever the I is, he calls a thinking thing. It's whatever it is that has ideas, feelings, judgments, volitions, and sensory images because it is impossible to be deceived about these things. And what I mean by that is that it's impossible to be deceived that you are experiencing these things. Those experiences themselves might be illusory or false, but the fact that you are having them is not subject to, um, to being false. What does this give us? It gives us certainty. It shows us that there really are some ideas that are impervious to doubt. And the hope is, from here, we can try to find more beliefs of the same kind and rebuild that whole inventory of beliefs using only these kinds. I'm going to stop here. There's more in meditation, too. Um, let me first ask if there's any questions about what we've covered, which has been a lot. Thank you for sticking with me and going on this marathon of modern philosophy. For next week, I want you to follow our revised schedule and to read um, up to page... Um, there are two readings. So it's page, up to page 68, so the rest of the meditations, and then bring your little book about women philosophers, and read pages 9 to 21. That one reads really quickly. And so next time we're going to finish Descartes and we're going to talk about Elizabeth's correspondence with him.